Good evening, everyone. My name is Douglas Sprang, and I lead the Energy and Environment Series for the MIT Club of Northern California. I'm delighted to kick off and moderate our first event of the new season. Over the years, we've featured top speakers in the fields of renewable energy, electric vehicles, storage systems, hydrogen, and climate change. Now, I'm sure we're all aware of the frightening signs that global warming is not only happening, it seems to be coming faster than earlier predictions. So are we toast? Or are solutions on the way that can mitigate these trends? To learn more this season, we're going to explore large-scale systems that are designed to make breakthroughs in CO2 emission reduction and are just now entering the commercialization phase. In addition to tonight's focus on concentrated solar power, also known as CSP, and thermal storage, these are systems, by the way, designed for utility class electricity generation in large commercial and industrial applications. Later this season, we'll also feature carbon-free steelmaking and standards-based power systems using small modular nuclear reactors. We'll have some more beyond that too, but these are the ones that are looking pretty clear now. Now, we have not enabled live Q&A, which is a change from our past, but we will answer many of the questions we got from online registration. Um, by the way, we recommend for your best viewing experience, put your Zoom view in gallery mode to get the feel of a fireside chat when both Bruce and I are on screen. Our speaker this evening is MIT alum and serial entrepreneur Bruce Anderson, founder and CEO of 24-7 Solar Inc. Um, join us, please, Bruce. Uh, his presentation will cover the technical and financial attributes of 24-7 solar power and thermal storage system with some specific applications, many of which are addressed today by coal power plants. We'll begin with an interactive interview and conclude the program with Q&A, much of which will address what's it like to start up and scale a new technology in the energy sector. Bruce will offer his insights to engineers, entrepreneurs, and early stage investors during this segment. So please stick around after his presentation to gain the benefit of his long career in the solar energy industry. So Bruce, welcome. And thank, thank you, you so Doug. much. Good to be here. Yeah, well, thank you so much for speaking to us this evening. Before talking about 24-7 solar, I'd like to ask you a few questions about how you got here. You received a BS in architecture and aero astro in 1970 um, at MIT and an MS in architecture in 1973, again from MIT. Your master's thesis was on applications of solar energy to building design. Was solar energy on your mind from the very beginning of your MIT studies? Hardly. No, that didn't that didn't come about until, um, or I guess, in the nineteen seventies. Um, I read Silent Spring, which really woke me up, and I attended the first Earth Day in nineteen seventy, and then I had to do a thesis, and that's how I chose it. It was, I didn't know I was going to be doing this at this late stage of my life. <laughs> so. So, but you you really did though have a lot of you were doing a lot of thinking about the whole subject, right? Of sustainability, yeah. climate change. I was stuff. just concerned about the future of our world. Yeah. And yeah. uh and when I when I discovered solar energy, it just seemed like a really natural solution. Did anybody personal to you have a big impact on you? Like somebody in your family, for instance? Well, my my father did. My father was a Lutheran minister, and um, and so saving souls translated into saving, and I want to do something to make the world a better place. I'm really proud of MIT that that's what its mission is all about. Yeah, great. Okay, now your thesis was turned into a book entitled Solar Energy Fundamentals in Building Design, followed by the best-selling the Solar Home Book, then followed by the rollout of Solar Age magazine, all of which you did. Did you intend to go into book writing and publishing, or did this just happen? Um, 
Well, it, it, it just happened, but it also happened because other people uh, triggered me to do it. Uh, somebody, Arthur D. Little, I was in the publishing business, got a copy of my uh, my thesis, asked me to write a book. Um, two other people came to me and said, let's turn this into a, and that, and that was for the college, a college text, said, let's turn this into a, a book. We self-published the Solar Home Book, became a bestseller. And then somebody else came to me and said, hey, here's some money. Let's start a magazine called Solar Age. So um, although it sounded like good ideas to me, so I just did them. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. Um, you know, another thing here is when you read your bio, which is was in the, the promo we sent out, um, the word founder keeps appearing over and over. For example, you founded uh, an architecture and engineering firm called TEA Incorporated, um, Ignite, an incubator to help develop and commercialize MIT technology, Solar Age magazine, already mentioned. You are founding director of the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association and founding co-chair of the New England Clean Energy Council. Good grief. You even co-founded Earth Day USA. <laughs> I never knew that, by the way, in all these years, but that's really something. So what's it like to be a serial entrepreneur? This is what it is. Um, I, I think you have to bit be pretty naive um, because I, I started all those things without really knowing what I was getting into. Uh, like I said about the books and the magazine, it seemed like a good idea at the time, it sort of excited me because it meant that I would be able to influence a lot of people instead of just design, say, a single building at a time. Um, and each one of those things also seemed important. Um, I mean, we needed a, a a Northeast Clean Energy Council. It was at that time when it was really important to get good policy in place throughout the Northeast around clean energy. So they just seemed like good ideas. Plus, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> well, but it seems like you weren't discouraged by doing I, it. So. I, I, th I think MIT gives you a certain level of confidence that... Um, says, if I can do this course or this paper or whatever, then, and something else comes along and say, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> but, I, can, I can second that motion. I mean, I remember back when I was there too, uh, change the world was one of the expressions we used and uh, make it for a better world, which is the slogan today is just, you know, a continuation of that. Yeah. Uh, more years later than I care to admit. So. <laughs> well, okay, so now here we are. Uh, you're the founder and CEO of 24-7 Solar, and it's an MIT-related spinoff. So could you tell us how this all came about? Yeah, um, I had formed my incubator called Ignite um, after I'd been uh, director of the industrial liaison at MIT, and I saw all these technologies on the shelf that had been patented, but nobody was doing anything with them. This was back in the day before there was the um, very, very robust infrastructure at MIT for facilitating and training startups. Um, and what would happen is that uh, technical people at MIT would start the business and thought that they had done the hard part by inventing the technology, that business was the easy part. And, and there are some notable successes, but the, the best approach has been that somebody who's not the inventor leads the company and the inventor leads the development of the technology. And uh, Professor David Gordon Wilson, who many of you know, I'm sure, and uh, studied under him and so on, fabulous human being, uh, he and I started a, uh, a business to commercialize two of his inventions that uh, MIT had patented. And what were those inventions? Oh, he had, he had invented um, a ceramic turbine, which means that it can operate at higher temperatures mm -hmm. and therefore get higher efficiencies. 
And he then invented a heat exchanger that was also ceramic to go with it. Um, and uh, so it wasn't solar. We were going to invent a very efficient um, uh, it, uh, uh, turbine, a Brayton cycle turbine, a, 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 mm -hmm. a gas turbine, an air turbine. Wow. And then, so you also formed the Ignite. Did you form an Ignite before you got involved in the components of the 24-7 uh, system? Yeah. In fact, um, this was the second uh, company that Ignite started. Um, and uh, after five years, this particular company, which was called Wilson Turbo Power at the time, was uh, hit a hit a wall, and both he and I jumped in and rescued it, and this is what it's turned into today: twenty four seven solar. Wow, uh, I'm, I'm sure this and more is going to be a fascinating story. Can't wait to hear more about it. So thank you for sharing it, Bruce. And now I'm sure uh, we're all itching to hear about the products, the technologies, and the markets of twenty four seven solar. So I will turn it over to you to do the presentation and we'll be back for Q&A at the end. Okay. Good luck. So um, not all of you are on the, on the West Coast, but a healthy percentage of you are. So I bring greetings from Boston. Uh, had this shot taken by my wife yesterday, Natalie, who is actually how most people, I think, at MIT know me now. I'm her, she's the current president of the MIT Alumni Association. Um, and I'm her husband, so I'm the first husband, or gentleman, I guess it is. And uh, we're in uh, uh, in the Boston airport on our, on our way to Wellfleet. And so greetings from Wellfleet, which is where I am tonight. The question is, can solar replace coal? That's what we're here to talk about tonight. And I'm gonna show you a way that it does. We have a, a technology that's zero carbon and provides both electricity and heat 24 hours a day. And that's basically our fundamental need. That's the problem we're solving, uh, climate change. And the key challenges are that, you know, the, the key technologies today are intermittent, batteries are costly, and, the, and they need backup generators. Something has to be there when the sun isn't shining, the wind isn't blowing. And then, of course, um, many applications, industrial processes require uh, require heat, and they're hard to uh, decarbonize. Um, so our solutions do provide round-the-clock uh, clean energy. We store energy as heat, not as electricity, which is cheaper. We don't require a backup generator. Uh, we can run on multiple fuels instead including biofuels and hydrogen, and we can generate industrial grade heat up to 1,000 degrees. And that's centigrade. Uh, translates to about 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are our breakthrough energies, uh, technologies, and they're, they're, they're based on, on uh, Dr. Wilson's uh, heat exchanger, which gave us this idea. And, uh, and the US Department of Energy when we submitted a proposal, said, finally, there are some new ideas in CSP, so we're going to fund you. And uh, we developed what's called a solar receiver that I'll talk more, more about that, that converts sunlight into heat, high temperatures. Um, we uh, then took the best-selling turbine in the world of its size, the most reliable. We took out, we literally removed the combustor and added a high temperature heat exchanger uh, ba based on, uh, on Dr. Wilson's, the work we did for him. And um, we developed a thermal energy storage system that can, op that can uh, store this, this high temperature heat uh, much more cheaply and, in, and, uh, and safely. Before I go into these, to describing these technologies to you, I'm going to first describe how we put them together into a system. 
Um, our first sale was to the 20th largest utility in the world, NTPC in India. And the purpose was to replace coal because over in India, they have lots and lots of PV um, photovoltaics. Um, but when sun goes down, the coal comes on and uh, they're, they, they don't want to do that. They, they, they have lots of coal, but they don't want to do that. And so they bought this to, to help solve the problem. So there, there are devices called heliostats that are mirrors on, on posts that are in the ground. And they coordinate with each other with using a computer to focus their light up on top of the tower. And there, the light concentrates on that solar receiver I mentioned. And that's what converts the light into high temperature heat. And we store some of it uh, for use uh, at night. And then, um, and then during the day, our turbines take the, the hot air from the receiver and at night they take it from the thermal energy storage system. Now all this is ambient pressure air. This is not high pressure air. This is the only turbine in the world that's ever been developed that takes ambient pressure, hot air, and makes electricity with no combustion or emissions. Um, these are some of the other attributes. Um, one of the byproducts of our system is that when the turbines operate, we produce uh, 500 degree F uh, heat. And um, and as I said, we don't require backup and, and, and so on. So we believe this is transformative. Um, the world does. They're being a path to our door. They, they literally, not, not, not literally, figuratively. They figuratively are. Uh, our pipeline is huge. And um, each, each of our, each of those towers uh, currently generates about 400 kilowatts. Now uh, that's enough for maybe 100, 100 houses in, in the U.S. and a community of maybe 10,000 in Africa. Um, and uh, it has lots of benefits to the grid because it, it can produce power whenever there's demand. So when, when grids are unstable and they need power, they can call on us. Um, they also have a unique function that when the grid goes down, they, they disconnect instantly, keep operating continuously, seamlessly. And then when the grid comes back on, they seamlessly connect back to the grid. More importantly, they can operate off the grid. So um, a lot of our potential customers actually produce their own power now and we can replace all the most of that fuel that they use um, and each plant produces about 50 percent more heat than it does electricity measured in kilowatts kilowatts thermal um, so in a sense it's free um, but the other nice feature about our system is that we can actually take the thousand degree centigrade heat off the top of the receiver and deliver that to an industrial process. So, and then we can mix and match those two streams and, uh, and meet almost any temperature industrial demand uh, in the world. And one of the first things I learned when I was in, in um, solar energy in buildings is to keep it simple. It's got to be, everything's got to be easy. Uh, my experience in solar energy was that, unfortunately, that, that things like pumps and, and valves and other things like that were the culprits. And it, it, it turned out to be the, the, the part of the system didn't work well. So you got to keep things really, really simple. Um, these are identical modules. So if you're going to build 10, it's like they're cookie cutters. Um, all of our components are produced in factory, just like a wind turbine. You bring them to the site, assemble them quickly, and you're off and running. Uh, they're easy to permit because we don't use any molten salts. And I should have mentioned that. I'm, I'll mention some more of this when I'm talking about the, the uh, thermal energy storage. But um, I don't like thermal uh, molten salts. Um, and we, we get as much 
we get twice as much energy per acre compared with PV when our heat is used. Um, and uh, these, these can operate just like PV systems with no operators. Unlike, uh, say, steam, steam turbines, most of our power plants in the world have lesions of people working 24 hours a day to keep that plant operating. Uh, and the life is very long, um, partly by its very nature, um, easy to finance. And in fact, um, one of the things that we're doing now is, 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 is raising a fund. That fund will enable us not to be, not, we won't, we'll no longer be forced to try to convince somebody to buy the system, which is going to, you know, cost them a lot of money, but we will build it, we will own it, operate it, and sell the energy to the customer. Uh, and, and the ROI in our system is just really, really impressive. What you see here is an example of, a, of an off-grid uh, industrial facility generating their own power. The savings is absolutely tremendous. Uh, this is the annual cost of ownership uh, for generating the the energy yourself or buying it from us. So it also has a, a whole range of, of applications because it's so flexible. Um, you know, I've mentioned off-grid a number of times, energy in, intensive industries, and then there's something called combined heat and power, which is uh, when a, a uh, application requires both heat and power, just like it says, combined heat and power. Um, and so we're actively pursuing, uh, uh, or and they're coming to us as potential customers, um, every category of application of our technology at this point. Uh, for mines, uh, these the, we're, we're focusing on remote community, on remote industries. And in particular for mines, we're looking at at uh, some of the critical uh, minerals required in the in the green energy transition, you know, copper, cobalt, lithium, and so on. And um, uh, one of the problems when you're off site like this, particularly in a place like Africa, even the supply chain and the fuel is a problem. Not to mention the highly fluctuate high fluctuation of price, and. Uh, it's hard to run a business when you can't predict the, the future cost of energy. So here's an example. Um, they're dependent on, on an expensive grid, uh, uh, on an undependable grid. Uh, so they have diesel, diesel fuel as backup, and they require 40 megawatts for, of clean power and uh, 20 megawatts of process heat. So this can be done in stages. Um, you know, the first year, phase two, phase three. And that's one of the advantages of our system too, is that from the moment you install the first module, you're getting power and heat. You don't have to wait for an entire power plant to be built before you get something out of it. You don't have to predict the future power needs by 10, 20 years uh, when you build a power plant. Power plants today will take, you know, five years of planning and five years of construction. Uh, data centers. This is this is potentially huge because data centers uh, can't tie into grids because grids don't have the power uh, to provide to the uh, data center. Uh, we can deploy this rapidly, which is what they need. They want to build these data centers quickly. They want them to be green, and they they want them to be really really reliable. And when you have multiple modules, you have unparalleled reliability. If one goes down, you have 10 or 20 or 100 more. Here, here's an example um, that we're pursuing in, in, with a customer in, in Arizona. Um, they need to deploy quickly, of course. They want it to be green, independent of the grid. They require 100 megawatts. That's a, that's a small data center. And then we offer the, the heat. So they can use the heat for air conditioning. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, it's called absorption chilling, and it uh, uses heat to produce cool. 
pretty pretty cool stuff. Um, and uh, so this is our solution, 100 megawatts of solar and our heat output. Uh, we have 18 hours uh, with two what we call heat store modules of storage and operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Combined heating and power, um, like I said, almost every industry that makes something um, requires process heat of some temperature. Provides on-site generation of both. Uh, avoids, th and this is, I, want, I, I can't overemphasize this. Companies want to be able to predict their future costs. And energy is usually a big one. And we stabilize their prices. They can predict them. And uh, they also eliminate the peak demand. And peak demand is what utilities charge during certain, some utilities, many, charge during certain parts, times of the day when um, they're in the middle of peak demand and, and the industry is billed a whole lot more by how much electricity they use during that peak. Uh, here's an example in Spain. Um, they have grid outages, uh, volatile energy prices. Uh, they require this smaller system, two megawatts of power and all three megawatts of our heat. And here we use six of our systems uh, and also uh, 2,200 kilowatts of PV. Now, the reason we do that, and we're doing that more and more with our systems, is we're combining the two into hybrids. We use PV during the day to generate power that's frankly cheaper than we can produce it. And then we're produce, we, we, we store all of our heat from the day and use that at night, you know, up to 16, 18 hours. Um, and, um, and that's a really nice solution. It, it gets you the lowest cost of energy, uh, gets you the hot, um, lowest carbon footprint and s stabilizes energy costs the most um, and uh, gives you the highest percentage of, of uh, solar, lowest, lowest percentage of, of backup fuel. Um, another example, not quite, it's not, it's not the same, but there's a community in, in, in Hawaii that only wants our system at night. And, uh, and Hawaii has tariffs, which is what the word that's used to, you know, for electric rates to, uh, to people who are uh, systems that are developed or who are generating power and selling it to them. Um, they have uh, highest rates at night when the sun isn't shining because they have so much PV. Okay, now I'll talk about the technologies. Oh, I, sh I should just say something about this. Uh, you, you see wind in the background, PV in the foreground, and then we're in the middle here, replacing the gen sets, the generator, the diesel sets. Um, so th this is our storage system. Uh, this is our turbine. And uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more about this in a few minutes, but Back here is an electric coil, and the um, the PV and the wind uh, charge or heat up our thermal energy storage. Uh, there, the excess, and then uh, the, that excess electricity is now heat. That heat drives our turbine, and um, when there's no nothing left of anything, uh, the uh, the turbines are capable of building of burning almost any fuel. And and let me let me address that point for just a sec. Um, we can we can burn almost any fuel. Obviously, we prefer biofuels and hydrogen, green hydrogen. Um, but we see that opportunity as a pathway to a zero carbon future. Uh, that okay, this turbine may not have access to clean fuels today, but it will in the future. And then it, it, it truly will be carbon free 24 hours a day. So let me go through the, uh, the three technologies, the receiver, 
uh, the turbine, which, which we call heat to power, and the thermal energy storage system. So the thermal energy storage system, can, like, like, like I've said, has turned sunlight into ultra high temperature heat, uh, 1800 F, 1000 degrees C. Um, it sits on top of a common thrust tower. It's only 35 meters, 120, 25 feet. And it's very, very durable. It just sits there. Um, no moving parts. And uh, our system has blowers and dampers. That, that's the only moving parts of our system that moves this ambient pressure air through the system. We developed this in collaboration with, with the leading experts on these air heating solar receivers. Uh, in addition to, um, well, because of its high temperature design, it operates at 50% at higher temperature than any of our competition, meaning any CSP, concentrated solar power. Um, so those, those towers you see, or those parabolic troughs that you see, are operating at much lower temperatures than we operate. And, um, and that gives us a, an efficiency edge. It also makes it, by the way, impossible to use molten salts for storage, which some of you are familiar with, which I hate anyway. Um, and then the turbine. Uh, I've already said it's the only one that uses ambient pressure hot air. Um, and uh, this is where the high temperature heat exchanger comes in uh, based on what Dr. Wilson invented. Now we don't use his invention, that's another story, but it is very high temperature and it replaces the combustor and the, uh, the blowers, like I said, move air through our system, move it through the turbine, and then there's a blower at the exhaust of the turbine that sort of pulls it through. Um, and uh, each of these turbines is 200 kilowatts, but um, we use two on each of our modules. So that's why the, the modules are 400 kilowatts. Um, and Capstone makes them under license uh, with us. So this turbine here is really cool. We, we, we can take a high temperature industrial exhaust and, and instead of uh, wasting it, well, we can create electricity. Um, and, uh, and then if you don't need it, you can sell it to the grid or wherever. It's super reliable. These, these about 10,000 of these turbines have been made and sold and their average uptime, uh, meaning they operate, <coughs> excuse me, 97% of the time, 97% of the time. A steam turbine um, only operates maybe, if you're, if you're fortunate, and have good people operating it, about 85% of the time. This is um, that, that heat storage system or generating system I showed you. Uh, with the turbine and the um, uh, and the PV in it, so we call it heat store. Some people call it heat story, but I like heat store. Uh, so there's a, the thermal storage. There's the turbine. Uh, there's the uh, electric coil that I mentioned, and uh, and this is what's charged by excess electricity, you know, such as solar and wind, and or even the grid for whatever reason has excess power. And usually that excess power is cheap. And that's what you charge it with. And then when it's expensive or there isn't any, then you can generate power and sell it back to the grid. And um, this also acts as a backup system because, because we can burn fuel if needed. So if, if you're in Texas and you have another one of those disasters or California, um, uh, you have unlimited backup. You don't have to worry about how long you have your storage system. I haven't talked about the heat, let's see, do I talk about the heat storage? Uh, let me talk about the heat storage. I just remembered, I don't think I have a slide on that. The heat storage is actually very simple. These are shipping container sizes. So they're made in factories, lined with insulation, shipped to the site empty, and they can be filled with 
iron slag, small pieces, uh, small pieces of, of ceramic, or even sand. Um, and then the blowers, there's some blowers in here that uh, here's the exit blower from the exhaust, the turbine, and here's the blower that circulates through the system. Um, it's a thermal storage that'll last forever. It won't leak um, like those on the West Coast have leaked. Um, and uh, it's inert, has no environmental issues, uh, no moving parts. Now, um, we're, we're also now developing you, what we call utility class modules. When wind power uh, first emerged, it too was only a few hundred kilowatts. And they got bigger and bigger. And, and now there's as much as 10, 15 megawatts each. Um, we, are, uh, we, are go we are going first to two megawatts. And that's on the drawing board. We expect to have uh, a two megawatt system designed in the year. And uh, we think we can go to five megawatts. We don't know if we can go higher than that. We, we, I know we'll want to, but we don't know if we can. Um, and um, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? You can read some of this. A lot of it gets to be kind of redundant after a while. Um, yeah, economics are critical. Um, it seems like I've always got myself into industries where it's all about cost and less about the value proposition or what else you're bringing to the, to the table. And, and, and these are great returns on investment. You can see the different kinds of applications, different locations, different sizes. And, you know, they're all pretty, pretty good bets for the investor. Uh, the reason they're relatively easy to finance is because they're stand, standardized and they're made in factories. And so, um, you know, the chance of something not being quite right is, is like a, you know, like a wind turbine comes off the assembly line, it's shipped to the site, assembled. And that's very, very different from building something from scratch on site the way a lot of conventional energy has been uh, over the years. I mean, even coal plants, all those, almost all of them are custom engineered. Almost all of them have enormous amount of site work and uh, a lot of opportunities for, for mistakes and, and, uh, and, and, and problems with the, with the, with the plant. Um, now, the ROI depends on a lot of factors. This is just, you can read yourself. Um, I thought of several more after I wrote this list. And so, you know, people will say, hey, give me a ball ballpark number on, on what this is going to cost or what the return is going to be. And I say, here's the questionnaire. We have a nice little questionnaire that we give people, fill out a few questions, just, you know, a few answers. And uh, we can get a pretty good idea of whether or not our technology can match the needs of that application in an economically persuasive way. So we get to the big question of the night. You know, can solar replace coal? Well, this is really the right question to ask. I want you to put yourself in sort of alternative future. Uh, imagine ourselves in a world with clean air, clean water, you know, very much less asthma, on and on. And somebody comes along and says, hey, I've discovered this great rock. Uh, you can burn it and you can burn it whenever you want to. You can carry it around all over the world to where you want a power plant and look what it'll do. Um, and then, you know, would you choose it? Would you choose coal? if we were living in a world like that? And I find that to be a really useful question. Um, I'm gonna to get to one more point before we leave here, but I wanna emphasize that all of coal's external expenses on society, externalities, 
are not paid by the ratepayer. They're paid by the taxpayer. Ratepayers don't pay for the black lung disease killing miners or the methane emissions from mining that are being talked about so loudly finally in the climate debate or the problems of, courting, you know, of giving us air pollution and the cost of cleaning it up. Just on and on. We don't, uh, ratepayers don't pay for that. But we're asking the ratepayers to pay for clean energy. Um, now, as far as our system goes, uh, I, I passed by earlier a project in Tunisia. That's uh, one gigawatt. A one gigawatt is a thousand megawatts. And they want to make green hydrogen. And when we produce a gigawatt, which is the size of a coal plant, our costs are competitive. The cost of our electricity is competitive. And so when somebody asks you, well, how does your cost compare? You, you really have to un understand, well, under what application? Um, what are we comparing? And um, so the answer, even on an economic basis, is a resounding yes. Solar can replace coal. Now, just a few last slides about 24-7 solar. Um, so these are um, articles about us on the right. Um, I mentioned that Professor Wilson co-founded co the, the business with me. And um, we're US-based. We were founded in, in two, 2015, 2015, um, but that's 24 seven solar that was founded then. Um, the original Wilson Turbo Power was formed much earlier, five years earlier. Um, our first deployment, as I said, um, uh, in India to the NTPC utility, uh, we have an incredible pipeline. I don't want to use numbers because they don't make sense to me either. They're so big. And I don't say that I'm not I'm not Donald Trump. I don't just exaggerate. These are things that have that are on our pipeline. Uh, we um, uh, we actually are engaged. they've they've we've shared with them a a preliminary feasibility study, and uh, they're still engaged. Some of them are waiting for the uh, project to be completed in in India, which will be next June, and uh, some of them are waiting for us to raise our fund and and sell them the power instead of the system. Uh, and we have over thirty patents granted worldwide. We just got our fifth patent in India a few weeks ago. We've just had best development partners, uh, and that's been one of the advantages of of uh, our system is that. We've had the opportunity to to work with the best, regardless of, of geographical location. And we have strong leadership. Um, I, I mentioned my wife, Natalie. Uh, uh, she's working uh, with us uh, sometime, sometimes less than part uh, half time, sometimes more, uh, in spite of her responsibilities to MIT as its president of the Alumni Association. And uh, you know, uh, Subrata here is in is in is in India. These characters over here are on the West Coast. Uh, Doug is an MIT alum. Um, we have an, uh, another employee in India, and uh, we have one in Spain. Um, we're looking hard at hiring somebody from uh, from Africa, um, and. Um, we're, we're building our team now. We didn't build our team during the development process because the development process at some point gets, hopefully is over and it isn't completely over. But now we're building out our staff as a commercial staff um, on a, to be with us on an ongoing commercial basis. So here are my... Um, uh, contact, uh, my contact information, um, uh, my address, that's a period between first and last name at 24-7 Solar. 
Uh, here's my phone number. Here's our website. Uh, you'll find the website to be pretty robust. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Back to you, Doug. Oh, wow. Innovative technology, no doubt. And um, that's always an important requirement for a breakthrough system. And I think particularly in, in these very, very large markets, because the incumbents that you're trying to replace are very large themselves, and they have reduced costs down to a much, much lower level. So the challenges of scaling up and, and getting cost levels down and so on and so forth are pretty monumental. Uh, for a company starting up there. And we're going to get a little bit more into that later. Um, uh, first of all, you mentioned, I believe it was 30 patents, but could you say a little bit more about um, the patents that you have, what they cover? And Yeah. And kind of yeah. Uh, thanks for asking that question uh, because it is something that's asked. Our proprietary technology is this receiver up here, um, the turbine, of course, uh, the thermal storage system, that we uh, designed ourselves. And then um, the whole system, uh, how they're all tied together, how they all communicate with each other. Um, the ambient pressure air system is patented by us. Uh, no one else can can build it without being in violation of our, of our uh, patents. Mm -hmm. So can you describe a little bit about how you were able to transfer some of the technology that was developed within MIT into your company? What was, what's the process there? Well, what, what it is, is um, you, you form the company sort of simultaneously with, with negotiating the license from MIT. And that's just a simple, straightforward, uh, it is simple and straightforward negotiation with the MIT Technology Licensing Office. Um, that's all there is to it. it. It seemed pretty easy at the time. Uh, they're easy. There's it's an office that's easy to work with. Right, and then so there are hmm. patents on that technology as well as any others that you create beyond that. Thing. that yeah. Correct? See what what happened was that. We, we, we ran into roadblocks developing that ceramic technology I mentioned, including the heat exchanger. But as we were looking for markets for the heat exchanger, we discovered this concept of heating air using an approach similar to this. I won't go into the differences, but they're different enough that we were able to patent everything here. Mm -hmm. And that gave us the idea of a high temperature heat exchanger inside the turbine. And uh, gratefully, uh, even though we didn't cross the finish line on the development of that ceramic heat exchanger, very difficult, um, there's a high temperature alloy that, that we've made a heat exchanger from that does the job perfectly fine for what we needed to do. But it was the inspiration of that heat exchanger that got us into this. So I didn't start off why I didn't start off wanting to do a solar another solar company. I had been burned. I was, I tell you, when Reagan terminated the solar tax credits, um, I didn't they didn't talk much about depression back then, but in retrospect, I was I was depressed and uh for about a year and said I would never again do solar never again do anything dependent on, on government support. And of course, here I am. Yeah, well, we're glad you persevered <laughs> doing that. So, oh, Doug, Doug, let me say one more thing about perseverance. Um, I wore this cap intentionally. That's T for tech. And those are rowing oars. And uh, I'll tell you, if you're a rower, I'll hire you. Rowers, know how to persevere <laughs> you, you have to work your butt off to be a rower and uh, that translates nicely into into business yes yeah i understand very well it turns out that the woman i i'm married to 
her, both her daughter and her son-in-law are are major uh, rowers and both won national championships when they were at their relative That's school. Good. So <laughs> I've heard all about it and uh, it, it is pretty exciting. Uh, you know, I think, you know, having done um, high technology for about 45 years myself, you know, it, 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 it takes an enormous amount of perseverance. It, you know, it's a, it's a grind on the one hand, but it's exhilarating at the same time. So, um, yeah. Well, okay. So back to your products again. Um, can you say a couple more things about what's really unique about your system in terms of either the com components within or the combination of the components that you just can't find anywhere else? Yeah. Um, and, and what, and like I said, it's patented the whole system. Um, combination of things. One is the high temperature. Mm -hmm. um, another is the ambient pressure air. Um, the other, uh, the big systems are grandparent CSP, I like to call it. Uh, and I mean that somewhat pejoratively because nothing much has changed in decades of that technology, that approach. Um, uses molten salts, so as we talked earlier, they use steam turbines. And it was actually invented, to its credit, I mean, it was invented to replace the fuel in steam turbine plants. That was why it was invented. Get rid of the, get rid of the fuel, get rid of the coal or whatever it was. And, um, and so that's, it wasn't designed from the beginning. What, what's the most logical way of producing power from the sun? Because they had a different mission. Just replace the fuel of a, of a conventional steam. Right, right. And so um, we use these solid materials for storage. That's that's very very different. Yeah. Um, and and uh, also that we're able, we've we've defined a way of having a single system solve all four of those problems that I outlined at the beginning. Twenty four hours a day. The 24 hours a day of operation, the 24 hours a day of storage, um, being able to um, uh, produce heat for for industrial processes, and uh, and I'm, I'm it, it, it's not almost 9:30. I forgot the fourth one, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, it, it it solves all the problems. Oh, it has a backup system. It, it can burn fuel. And everything else out there requires a backup system. Every other form of power generation requires a backup system. If you've got a CSP steam turbine, that steam turbine is going to go down. And you're going to need a power plant someplace else. That will never be the case with our system. You'll never need another to build another power plant somewhere else to make sure that the customer has power when ours goes down, because ours won't go down because of the redundancy of, of, of the systems and the turbines. Yeah. Wow. Well, so um, we got a couple of questions uh, from people during registration, um, and they're more trying to get a sense about understanding what you've got versus some projects they know about already. Uh, one of them is, um, uh, the question is, is this technology used in Crescent Dunes? Now, Crescent Dunes is a, solar energy project um, that actually also uses concentrated solar power, but it uses molten salt. And we're gonna get back to that in a second. Um, with an installed capacity of 110 megawatts and um, over a gigawatt, gigawatt hours of energy storage. So that's one. And the other one uh, was asked about, is this basically uh, Ivan Pa, uh, which is also concentrated solar thermal plant. I'm not sure what the storage mechanism is. Um, it's out in the Mojave Desert, um, but it's this person judged it to not be particularly economical compared to yours. Um, so how would you compare what you got to those two projects, just to put it in perspective? Well, to their credit, they really broke ground. Um, uh, there hadn't been too many other CSP systems built, um, and they were they were really um, miracle workers, in a sense, to attract the financing, 
um, do the engineering, getting them built, but they didn't have the the advantage that we have of being modular and having things made in factory and bring out the risk, bring out the problems uh, as they emerge and then, and then build more and more and, and eventually have something that operates with little or no problems. They, they built them from scratch with almost no operating experience around the world. And, um, and, and, you know, I give them a lot of credit for that. But having said that, the result is uh, high high costs of construction and high cost of operation. And our first systems will produce power and heat at uh, at prices that are competitive with those, and we're at the top of our cost curve. And we've all seen what's happened to wind and PV. The cost has come down like this, and they come down with volume. And uh, and that's why I said that that one gigawatt, hundred megawatt system in Tunisia will be competitive with coal because of the cost has really come down with volume. Okay. So um, one of these questions are what are the compelling use cases for your systems? Now you showed some examples and everything. Um, I'm wondering though, which ones are you most excited about? What Which ones do you think are going to be the major growth drivers for your company? Well, um, there, there, there are two there are beachhead markets that we're focused on proactively. Um, one is mining. And the reason for that are some of the things I said earlier, is that the costs to these mines of producing their own energy, energy is outrageous. It's really, really high. And so we can get a really nice return on our investment and we have give them much lower cost of energy and a stable cost. Um, and so we're, we're, we're literally hiring somebody to pursue that market, somebody who knows that market and has experience in it. Um, the other is data centers. It wasn't even on our radar screen a year ago, but data centers are investing billions in, um, technologies like fission that won't be available to them for years. And we have a, we have a solution that's available today and we can install it quickly and it'll be highly reliable, economically competitive and solve all of their energy needs. And um, so we're looking for an initial data center customer uh, to break us into that market. Great. That's one. You said there were two. What's the other one? Oh, the other one's the pines. Oh, the oh, of course, the mines and data centers. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's not that late here, but I must. I <laughs> You're older than I am, Doug. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's an excuse. <laughs> so, um, how large do you think these markets could ultimately get? I mean, for your application. Well, we we have numbers, but they're so big they don't make any sense, and we can't capture the whole market anyway. You know, in all these markets are so large that if we only capture five percent of one of them, it will be an enormous business. And so, if we capture only five percent of a of a bunch of them, uh, will be bigger than enormous. Yeah, but what if you capture twenty five percent? <laughs> or 50%, that now you have a whole new problem. It's how do I build this humongous company from, <laughs> from our humble beginnings? Oh, trust me. Somebody who knows how to do that will take my place. All right. So I don't know how to do that. You're going to be the good entrepreneur and let it go when it's time to let it go. Oh, yeah. I won't have any problems doing that. <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that's a great role to play. Honestly, I, in my own career, I, I took advantage more, I think, on riding the coattails of people that pioneered stuff and then did that very thing, okay? Made it as big as it could be. Um, both jobs are really important. So you can't, God bless can't you. do it without either one. You know? If you were younger, I'd be talking to you about it. 
yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, did it, does it help that solar is a more mature technology in the products that you're building now? Or are they still pretty unique and new from that standpoint? Um, I didn't quite get the question, Doug. Well, you know, it's like it's you get these new technologies, particularly in large markets like energy markets, where at the beginning their cost levels are much higher, uh, but with volume they can come down and everything. But solar, of course, has been around now for a couple of decades and is getting to be in pretty large supply. But most of it, I think, is photovoltaic. And maybe that's where most of the cost reductions have occurred. But I was wondering if, are there other parts of your system where uh, cost reduction has already occurred? So you're getting some leverage from all that? Or are you, are you really starting out from scratch as well? We're starting off from scratch. And let me give you an example. Um, these heliostats over my shoulder here, which point, which reflect their light up on the top of this tower to the solar receiver. Um, these are between four and five hundred dollars per square meter right now. Now you don't have any context for that, but let me just yeah. share that the DOE Department of Energy has set a price goal, cost goal, of fifty dollars per square meter, not 400, okay? So there's a, and and I can see it myself, there's just an enormous amount of, uh, of opportunity for reducing the, their costs. And that's the highest percentage cost of our system. No other component is a higher percentage cost. Mm -hmm. um, we're also exploring like I said, the the larger systems, you know, two megawatts and five megawatts, over, overnight our cost will drop, just because of the larger system, on a on a per megawatt per kilowatt basis. Um, we are, um, we're we're even exploring putting everything on top of a tower, even in the storage and the turbines. Um, so there's a lot of room for for cost reductions. So um, <clears throat> industrial applications, I'm kind of fascinated by this because I spent most of my time looking at power generation, and, you know, renewable energy and the like uh, while we've been doing this energy and environment program. Um, but um, industrial applications, you know, represent a very large percentage of carbon emissions today. Uh, a lot of it because of the high temperatures required and so on. So um, you've got, and, and, and maybe you can go through this again, exactly how it comes about, uh, 250 degrees C capability, and then also ability to go as high as 970 degrees C. Um, where, how do these applications, or how do these temperatures fit in the market for industrial uh, processes like this? And how, so what, kind of like what kind of market share do you have available because of these temperatures you can provide? Well, um, I sort of thought a question like this might come up. And so I added one more slide that I haven't sh shared with anybody. And, um, and this sort of helps. This, this is the guide over here of temperature. So... The really dark is is the iron and steel and non-metallic metals and chemicals and and so on. A lot of a lot of high temperatures over there. Now we can't yet, I say yet, get above get above a thousand degrees centigrade. Um, but we're up there pretty high. So we can get a large percentage of this of that market. But point the interesting thing that I find about this graph is that even for those high temperature applications, they require some lower temperature heat. Uh, they don't have cement on here, but a cement plant, for example, requires 1500 degrees for the, um, oh, I, I know what the word is, but again, it's really getting late. Uh, but look at all the other heat that they use here where they, they actually use a lot more than this for 
lower temperature heat. They they use a lot of heat throughout the throughout the cement making process. But you can see here where we go up to uh, 200 degrees. Uh, all these here, these are all we can cover. All these with our 250, and then uh, if needed, we can go higher. Um, uh, taking heat off right off the right off the receiver. Yeah. So now, so, do these plants want to have their own energy source, their own, if you will, private energy source, rather than trying to get it from the grid? Well, a lot of these companies right now are burning fuel to get their their heat, mm -hmm. um, and they're all under pressure to reduce their carbon emissions. Right. Uh, the price of the fuel has been really volatile, and this won't be the last time it's volatile. And they, again, they need to predict their energy costs. Uh, so if they have a, a super reliable source of carbon-free heat, they'll jump on it every time. Mm -hmm. And most industries, that there are a lot of there are a lot of um, solutions. You know, the human human brain is very creative, and there are a lot of of industrial heat, clean industrial heat applications coming on where uh, wind, solar, the grid are heating these devices up uh, to temperatures even above a thousand. And um, and those are great. They they produce the heat that these uh, these industries need, but they don't produce the electricity because uh, yeah. they also need electricity. So I hadn't thought about this question before, but I mean, do you see a lot of maybe private installations being done because of this, where they literally maybe have one of your systems on site? We haven't targeted industry and industry hasn't come to us very much and the reason is they aren't looking and they don't know about us and they don't know this kind of solution exists um we are we were we were at one point close to a, an opportunity in spain for a food processing company and uh, we we've, we've uh, had discussions with others but they haven't borne fruit yet Okay, so still well, possibly emerging market later on, but oh yeah, yeah, that'll be a later market. Our generation is is the first priority. Okay. Um so how many systems have you actually built now? Well, we haven't built any systems. There are the first system we sold was to the one in India that I mentioned a couple of times. Right. And that'll be built next year. And the rest of our pipeline mostly is waiting either for it to be completed before they proceed, because we're at the stage then that we're selling them the system, or they're waiting for our, our project fund to be raised so that we can build our system our, ourselves on our own nickel and sell the energy to the customer. Mm -hmm. But we have an extremely robust pipeline uh, we talk to customers several times a week. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes several times a day. Sometimes so when I'm, you when you do, when you fund those systems, um, how are you going to do it? How are you going to get that amount of money? Well, people have come to us. People routinely come to us and says and say, "Do you have any projects uh, that need financing? Green mm -hmm. projects that need financing? There's a lot of green project financing money out there." all over the world. The world's very rich. And uh, we're organizing ourselves now as we speak to go out in a formal process and and uh, and raise that fund. We know we can raise just a matter of doing it and putting the resources together to do it. Right. Good. Great. So one of the things, you know, a lot of people talk about are like the supply chain issues and so on. And uh, do you have any concerns about getting materials for like some of your components or things with, that may be rare minerals or scarce materials uh, or long supply chains or from from locations that you'd prefer not to be doing business with. I mean, how what's it look like for your system today for all of this? Well, we're really bullish on a supply chain for our system. 
um, because of our two team members in India and our project in India, uh, we're building a pretty robust supply chain in India of our equipment. And this is equipment that's off the shelf. I mean, this tower is off the shelf. Um, all the metal components, uh, the metal components of the thermal storage, um, of the housing around the the uh, 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 the solar receiver, um, the support structure for the uh, uh, the blowers, um, and even the blowers and dampers themselves, all the piping that we use, uh, the support structures for the heliostats, um, the controllers for the heliostats. These things are available uh, throughout the world, frankly, and. Uh, and one of the value propositions that we offer uh, our, our um, potential customers is that we, we buy as much of the equipment locally as we can. And we use local contractors and we use local labor to operate the system, maintain it, clean the heliostats, uh, lubricate the blowers and dampers. Um, and, um, and this is really well received by by countries that we're talking to great well i think we're going to probably get close to winding down here and one of the things i always like to hear about is partnerships possible partnerships um you've got a lot of great development partners you've shown us already uh, but what about those companies that might be able to help you scale up um certainly funding is a big part of that uh as it sounds and and so on uh, do you see anything out there like that, or are you going to be mostly going it on your own? Well, as a matter of fact, we got a, an email to that effect today. I haven't had time to read it. I'm trying to take some time off, uh, except for tonight. Um, but uh, I skimmed it, and and that's what it was. It's a big multinational company, and uh, they want a partner <coughs> to do just exactly what you're saying. Uh, is it fun? You mean funding, or do they want to do it some other, as a, maybe a supply chain or something? Um, well, they they definitely want to market and install, and mm -hmm. and um, and of course <clears throat> to meet their expectations, we'll need some of their funding too. Right. Okay. You know, to do a data center, for example, um, we would definitely want a funding partner who can help us gear up. Um, our, our system to be able to to um, to build <clears throat> um, to build you know 50 100 megawatts a year right. we would build up our, our our team and our supply chain but a marketing and installation partner for what's a global business is a wonderful thing to have if you're a startup company because getting a global fo footprint takes a lot of time and effort so yeah but interestingly it 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 does but interestingly, um, first, Zoom makes it much, much easier. And the simplicity of our system makes it much easier. And the mm -hmm. ability to use local contractors and local builders and local labor. All these things really do make it easier. As I said, two of our team members are in India. Uh, we have one in, in Spain. Uh, we're looking at one in, in Africa. So it's really not that hard anymore to run a virtual business that's global in scope. Well, you know, I'll tell you, it's it's 645 out here in the West Coast and it's 945 back there. So maybe it's a good time to wrap up. Um, uh, Bruce, I'd just like to thank you so much for being uh, willing to do this and all the time and effort it took to put this together. And um Normally, when we had in-person events, we'd be giving you a bottle of California Cabernet, but uh, I can't even ship you one because of the doggone laws that are out there preventing that from happening. But um, all I can do is just say thank you so much, and I wish you all the best in your endeavor. Well, well, thank you. Even though this isn't live, I can I can hear the clapping, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I really really wish that. That I could see everybody's face because I just know there are a lot of, a lot of people out there that I know, and and love, and um, 
MIT means so much to me as it does to so many people watching. So I really appreciated this opportunity. Well, thank you for helping us kick off our season. And um, I hope you'll watch a few of our other events as the time uh, wears on. So you're Thanks not too to busy. Hope you know. sounds, sounds like a great program. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.